Hello, and welcome to part one of County Health Rankings and Roadmaps and NeighborWorks America's Creating Communities That Thrive series. Today, we'll explore the intersection of public health and community development. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a collaboration between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is excited to partner with NeighborWorks in this two-part series to consider how thoughtful community development can improve health. My name is Erica burroughs Girardi, and I'm a community coach with County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Ali Havilla, who will be answering your questions that you will submit in the question box. Hi, Ali. And Allie, maybe I'll meet. Hey, yep. Allie. Hey, sorry <laughs> about that. Um, hi, everyone. Glad to be here with you this afternoon. Thanks, Allie. I'm pleased to introduce you to Sarah Norman, the Director of Healthy Homes and Communities at NeighborWorks America. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Erica. Good afternoon, everyone. And lastly, I want to introduce you to Jennifer Wagley, the Director of Avenue Community Development Corporation. Avenue CDC is based in Houston and is a member of the NeighborWorks Network. Welcome, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. We'll hear more from both Sarah and Jennifer momentarily, but I also want to thank other colleagues who are working behind the scenes today, including Justin Rivas, who will be chatting with you today. Thank you so much, Justin, and, and knowing Justin, he's probably chatting out a greeting now if he hasn't already. Um, now I want to turn it over to Allie to explain how you can interact with us during today's webinar. Great, thanks Erica. Um, and I would just note when folks were joining, we shared a video and it's, see, uh, we're hearing from a couple of you that that might have been blurry. So apologies on our end, but hopefully the screens have cleared up and we're just gonna go over a couple of, of those Zoom tips and tricks. Um, so we really do want to encourage you to ask questions along the way. Um, and so if you have a question for our panelists, simply uh, click on the Q&A control box. And when you do, a question and, question and answer box will open up. And there's a spot where you can type your comments, your questions. Uh, then click submit to send your questions. And again, send those questions in at any point. Next, we also want to encourage you to share ideas um, and chats with all of the attendees. Um, and so there's a space for you to use your comments, uh, either to share broadly or to respond to questions that we may ask during the webinar. To use the chat feature, uh, click on that control, click chat on the control panel. A chat box will open up and you'll also see a space here to type your comments. Click enter to submit your response. Um, and we would note that you have the option to chat with all attendees or the panelists only. And we ask if you're comfortable to chat with all of the attendees so that other participants can see the ideas that you're sharing. So again, just a quick introduction to the Zoom features. We look forward to engaging with you. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Erica. Thank you so much, Allie. Um, as we begin to think about creating communities that thrive, I want to start by first sharing how county health rankings and roadmaps support communities to do just that, thrive. We at county health rankings and roadmaps support communities in bringing people together to look at the many factors that influence health, select strategies that can improve health for all, including closing gaps, and make changes that will have a lasting impact. And we do this by providing data, evidence, and guidance for communities. We also work together and share stories of communities around the country that are at different points in this journey to serve as examples and inspiration for you and your partners. All of these activities advance health equity, which ultimately leads, leads to improved health outcomes. So the supports that we offer communities are rooted in our rankings model. Now, hopefully, most of you have seen this model and it looks familiar, but let me take a, few, a moment just to show you how the model helps explain what drives health in community. The model shows the relationship between policies, programs, health factors, and health outcomes. With this model, we can see that all of these factors impact how long and how well we live. 
So starting from the bottom, we know from research that effective local, state, and federal policies and programs can improve a variety of health factors that in turn shape the health of communities. Many health factors, those you see in the blue boxes, shape our community's health outcomes. We specifically look at four buckets of health factors, health behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. And then we measure two types of health outcomes, those you see at the top in the green boxes, to show how healthy each county is, and that's length of life and quality of life. So let's see how this translates into a real life example. Expanding early childhood education improves academic achievement, and this results in higher graduation rates. Higher levels of education lead to higher levels of income, which make it easier to access healthy foods, clinical care, and quality housing, all of which in turn influences health outcomes. Now again, policy is at the foundation of the model. This means that in order for everyone to have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy, we must redress policies that have caused health inequities. When communities do not thrive, their residents are not experiencing that fair and just opportunity to be healthy. Let me give you an example. This map created from the Commission to Build a Healthier America shows lifespan disparities across the DC metro system. Now, the life expectancy for those living in the city center hovers around 72 years. But look how much life expectancy improves as we move away from the city center. The difference can be as great as an additional nine years. This disparity reflects differences in wealth, education, and environment across all community residents. And the differences are even more dramatic, sometimes even double, if you compare black and white residents. This phenomenon, although more common than you would think, should not occur. Your neighborhood should not determine your life expectancy. This is why organizations like NeighborWorks and the work that they do is so important to health. In a moment, we'll hear from Sarah, who will share more about how NeighborWorks is creating healthy and equitable environments. But first, let's hear from you. Have you noticed disparities in health outcomes in the communities that you either live in, work, or play in? If so, feel free to, to chat that in the box and also chat about some of the solutions that you may have noticed that's closing the gaps. Be sure to chat to all of the panelists, so um, all panelists and attendees rather, so we can all see your chats. And in a moment, I'm gonna ask Justin to, um, to tell us what he's seeing in the, the chat box. So Justin's gonna actually chat out that question for you. And right now, I am going to welcome back Sarah Norman with NeighborWorks. Sarah joined NeighborWorks in 2014 as Director of Healthy Homes and Communities. This position recognizes the important role that homes and neighborhoods play in determining health and the focus that NeighborWorks places on promoting health through community development. Her understanding of deep connections between health and housing first developed when she was Bureau Chief for Lead, Asthma, and Healthy Housing at the Baltimore City Health Department. Previously, Sarah was a director and senior advisor at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And Sarah also worked on health policy in the U.S. Congress. So welcome back, Sarah, and thank you so much for, for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, Erica. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I was thinking maybe it would be great for you to start with telling our audience uh, more about NeighborWorks and County Health Rankings and Roadmaps and how we came to be working together. Great place to start, Erica. So a couple years ago, NeighborWorks and the County Health Ranking and Roadmap Program and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation partnered to look at ways in which housing and community development organizations could build health act equity through cross-sector partnerships. Um, and we did this through a Healthy Communities Demonstration Project. We had 28 organizations across the country. You can see um, the different stars and squares and uh, red dots um, to think about how they could work to improve 
uh, cross-sector partnerships. Um, the different colors, the red were seed, um, early efforts. The roadmaps to action uh, were situations where folks had partnerships in place, but were really trying to figure out next steps. And then the stars were innovation for shovel-ready projects where they had evaluation plans and programs and strategies. Um, one of the participants in this Healthy Communities Demonstration Project is Avenue CDC, Jennifer, and um, she's a NABWORKS member who's gonna share her experience and her work in Houston um, as part of this Healthy Communities Demonstration Project. Great, and also County Health Rankings and Roadmaps provided some coaching to those communities that were in the Roadmaps to Action. Yes, indeed. Um, so Erica and Allie were on this webinar, and Justin, who are helping out with this webinar, were all amazing coaches. Um, it's wonderful to work with you. Yeah, thank you. Well, not to brag on us, but yeah, we wanted to give ourselves a plug. <laughs> but um, Sarah, some folks might be surprised that a national housing and community development organization is thinking about health. So can you share a bit more about community de development and how that is connected with health? Sure. Um, let me start with a story. I always feel like a story does better than um, just starting with some statistics. And this is the story of Dorothy Richardson. And, and she's the woman you see with a hammer standing in front of a door um, that was, about, was going to be torn down, but for the work of her and some community partners. So she, in the 1960s, was living in Pittsburgh, and her neighborhood was in decline, partly due to redlining policies that prevented most banks from lending to her and her neighborhoods. And at that time, um, most cities tried to solve this issue by demolishing neighborhoods. But Dorothy Richardson knew that she and others were willing to fix their homes if they could get loans. And so she and her neighbors, city bankers, and government officials convinced 16 financial institutions to make conventional loans in the community, and a local foundation capitalized a revolving loan fund. They named this organization Neighborhood Housing Services, and it became a model for organizations nationwide. So Dorothy Richardson is credited with introducing a new model of community development, um, and she um, is one of the folks who, um, well, uh, to give you a sneak preview, is part of how NeighborWorks America came to be. NeighborWorks America was created to scale up this model. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1978, Congress institutionalized this network by establishing Neighborhood Reinvestment Corporations, now known as NeighborWorks America. Today, we're 250 member organizations. Avenue CDC is one of them, um, but in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. And some of the statistics you see on the screen, you know, show some of the, the housing work that's going on from, you know, 55,000 homes repaired in a year, 21,000 new homeowners, all that good stuff. But there's also work that's done that we call comprehensive community development that really thinks about the whole neighborhood context and how to engage community members just like Dorothy Richardson does in really restoring and revitalizing neighborhoods. Yeah, you guys have come a long way from Dorothy Richardson to the work and the support that you provide people right now with being able to, to have home ownership, etc. You guys do so much work. So, um, so I was, you know, whenever I, I see CDFI and CDCs, I can't really complain because, you know, public health has a lot of alphabet soup, too. But as I've been working with NeighborWorks and other community development partners, I've noticed that you guys also have a lot of alphabet soup. So can you, can you for our audience, I know, can you for our audience um, just tell us a little bit more about CDFIs and CDCs? Because that's, we who are in public health, we hear those terms a lot lot and we're not really sure what they mean. Sure. And, and let's, you know, I'm starting with CDFIs and CDCs, but there's, you're right, there's a whole alphabet soup beyond that. So one of the things, um, the two major institutions that work in community development are called community development finance institutions and community development corporations. Community development corporations are mostly nonprofit, um, just to confuse folks, um, who work in urban, suburban, and rural communities across the U.S. A lot of them are neighborhood-based, but they may also work in, in multi-state environments. Um, and I think one of the things that's important is that some folks think um, community development is only in urban areas, but it's in all different geographic communities. Um, and community development corporations, called CDCs for short, really rely on this notion of resident leadership and engagement to drive and plan for 
the building of a, a stronger neighborhood and community. And they generally engage multiple social determinants of health in that process. Um, CDFIs are a more specific community development finance institution or a more specific uh, institution. They're nonprofit banks that provide capital support for low income projects and people. Um, and I think it's important to get a sense of this size and the scope when you're thinking about partnership. Uh, so there's a there's more than a thousand CDFIs across the country with assets totaling well over 25 billion. Um, you might have heard of the reinvestment fund or the low income investment fund, um, also NeighborWorks Capital. They're all examples of established CDFIs that work across the nation. Um, many of them, however, work uh, have narrower geographic areas. Um, and, and we started with CDCs and CDFIs because they're the two most basic terms, but um, I could, you know, spend forever and talk about low income housing tax credits. Instead, I'll suggest two opportunities to learn more if you want to get into this alphabet soup. One is the Build Healthy Places Network has a jargon buster, and you can go to their website and find that. Um, and I'm sure Justin, being uh, the incredible um, Zoom Zoomer, is that the term, <laughs> is, 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 is sending that link out. Um, you can also consider taking a course at the NeighborWorks Training Institute if you want to spend a day or two days learning more about um, housing and community development. But CDCs and CDFIs to start. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I'll also um, take this opportunity to tell our audience that we have put together a resource guide for you, including um, Jennifer and Sarah have added some resources to that guide too. And it's on our website right now. And you can delve into a little bit more about CDFIs and CDCs um, with, with one of those links that's on that resource guide. So, um, but thanks for that introduction. Now, um, Sarah, earlier, you know, I was, I was talking to our audience about the differences that we see, um, the disparities rather, that we see sometimes within um, communities, sometimes only 10 miles apart, we'll see a disparity in health outcomes. And um, this is something that you all are working to, mm -hmm. to resolve. So can you share how community development is tackling these deep disparities in health? Yeah, I mean, community development nonprofits are, are often working in the neighborhoods which have the most significant barriers to good health and well being. Um, and I'm really excited to share a few examples across the country of how community development is working with health and other partners to reduce um, health disparities, to build health equity. And I'm going to do it through the lens of the Healthy Communities Demonstration Project. And one of the things we saw through these cross-sector partnerships is that community development organizations were able to use various strategies to improve various outcomes in social determinants of health. Um, so everything from um, improving housing stability measures to reducing emergency department visits um, to in improving you know, resident assessment of police community relations, um, food security, all those different things, um, because many of these organizations are familiar and used to um, working around multiple different social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, when they think about evaluation and results, they're thinking about most, multiple social determinants of health at once. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and I know you want to start with um, this example in Willamette because they actually have made a concerted effort to advance health equity with their work. Right, so let's start with Neighborhood Housing Services of Willamette, which is in Oregon, um, and they have 19 rental communities, um, some, uh, largely in rural and small town environments. Um, and one of the interesting things about them is you don't often think about a community development organization being the backbone or the, the convening organization of a health equity alliance, but they are. Um, and they have worked with schools to do wellness policies and a variety of other things. They also are really thinking about their residents. Um, and so that goes from, you know, the traditional green and healthy homes, you know, approaches to their buildings, but it goes well beyond that. Um, um, so one of the things I wanted to put a spotlight on is they have a community health worker effort that they're doing in partnership with the Intercommunity Health Network Coordinated Care Organization, IHCCO, which is a coordinated care organization. Um, Oregon has CCOs, which are similar to ACE, uh, accountable care organizations, if you're familiar with that health, health alphabet soup. Um, <laughs> but they did develop a community health worker program, and with a variety of different programs, one of the things that they were able to do is work with this organization to show
show that emergency department visits uh, went down and then have stayed down over a two year period because um, they're really engaging um, residents and responding to residents and wrapping around a wide variety of services that are improving health outcomes. Right, right. That's awesome. Just responding to those needs as, as, as they should, really. So um, in this next example, you're going to tell us about how a payer has helped with um, community development. Great. So let's go to Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona in the Maryville neighborhood. Uh, Chicanos por la Causa is a neighbor, another NeighborWorks organization that was involved in the Healthy Communities Demonstration Project. And in 2011, um, well, actually, let's start a little bit before, um, Chicanos por la Causa, CPLC, started to invest in this community by developing a community center the Maryvale Community Center. And they brought together a wide variety of health and social services there. Um, and in 2011, they realized that they were missing out. They were missing out on a critical partner. Um, they approached United Health Group, which is a managed care organization across the U.S., and they explored what would be a potential partnership. And they started with an IT system to track and coordinate um, services in the Maryvale Community Center, which you see right here. Um, and they did a pilot nutrition program which, uh, around diabetes prevention, and they were able to show some improvements um, with various diabetes control measures. And then um, in 2015, they took this partnership to a whole new level. Um, they looked at um, a partnership around housing, um, obviously one of the key determinants of health, um, especially for folks who are homeless or, or potentially housing insecure, mm -hmm. um, and developed a $20 million partnership with a low interest loan that's going to lead to the redevelopment of a 500 unit affordable housing community right near this Maryville Community Center. That's awesome. And I, you also want to give an example um, of some work that's happening here in my state in Florida. So tell us what's happening in Lake Worth. That's exactly why I chose it, Erica. <laughs> um, if it's in Florida with Erica, it's got to be great. Okay, so um, this is a really interesting example. It's um, Community Partners is another NeighborWorks organization, um, and they have partnered with Palm Healthcare Foundation. They're working with three communities um, to really do resident-driven efforts to drive towards health improvements. Um, but they did it in a sort of an untraditional way. Um, they, they, they really said, okay, let's think about this investment. It's a, a, a million dollar in partnership with, um, with, with this healthcare foundation. Let's start with the residents. Let's ask them, what are your priorities? They allowed them to choose from three different priorities. And this community chose behavioral health. And then the next step they did is to say, okay, residents, Okay, residents. That's not. That was not the most elegant way to say, say that. But they asked residents, "How do you define that? You know, what does that really mean?" And they came to this understanding that our vision is that individuals are, and the community is, self-reliant and resilient, and have mo balance in body, mind, body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. um, great definition. And one other thing, and not a traditional clinical definition. And they're using this. Um, this really community input process to shape what they'll do next. Um, they have three groups that are working. Faith-based is one. Healthy food access is another. Trauma and violence is another. And the evaluation will be de determined and influenced by what they said their goal was, what the residents said. Love it. This also happens to be the community that Allie um, coached, by the way. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks, at least we here um, in public health, we do understand the value of connecting with community development. Often we stumble on how to make that connection or stumble in thinking about what is it that we have to offer community development. Mm -hmm. So can you help us with that a little bit? Yeah, and I think, so we designed this this project to have three levels of organizational readiness. Um, and some of the examples I gave were some of the innovation examples, but some of the roadmap examples. And I think it's also important to think about the seed folks and sort of how those partnerships were built um, and to really go from these baby steps and these pilots all the way to, you know, maybe a larger partnership like the one that Chicanos por la Causa and United Health have. Um, and some of the early things that happened for some of these groups was 
for example, you know, simply a health department offering support around smoke-free housing. You know, the housing organization wanted to go smoke-free, but recognized that residents might have resistance to that and really wanted to survey residents and figure out the best way to do it. So there's early wins like that. And I think most of the organizations had early, early wins and pilots early in their efforts. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, a Zumba class offered on site. Uh, a co another common early win was um, having uh, health staff located in affordable housing mm -hmm. uh, communities. Right. Yeah. And then um, you were saying, uh, I know when you and I talked earlier, you said in some cases, health um, public health practitioners have been able to engage community development partners with their community health improvement plans. That's right. That's it. Yes, absolutely. And that was, you know, the neighborhood developers was one of the ones who joined a community health needs assessment and that led to a different approach. Yeah, yeah. So um, if we want to connect with um, a community development or a member of your network, this is how they can do it, right? That's right. It's online um, and we, you can look it up by zip code. Um, and if you have any, you know, if you're, if you see that there's an organization in your state, but not necessarily in your town, um, check them out because some of our, many of our organizations serve multiple communities. Okay, great. Thank you so much for giving us that, you know, that great introduction into the world of um, community development. Um, hang in there. I don't want you to leave because we're going to have questions and answers coming up. Um, and we're going to, to hear from Jennifer in just a moment to have to hear some specific examples of how community development is working to improve health locally. But first, I want to um, check in with Justin and see what he's been seeing coming through our chat. Remember, I asked you all to tell us what disparities and health outcomes you may have noticed and also what solutions you see happening in local communities. Justin. Hey, everyone. Um, I think, Erica, you posed the question as, as have they seen any inequities? And to that, we got about 200 yeses <laughs> in the chat. Um, and then I reframed it to provide the examples, and we got some really good ones. Um, mm -hmm. So Michael shared um, that having clinics in walkable locations, I'm not sure if that was the, the challenge that there aren't walkable locations, but that could be a solution. And then uh, Chris from Houston shared that uh, mobile clinics could be a good way to address that inequity. Uh, David from Philadelphia shared that there's a life expectancy gap of 20 years uh, within the city, which is um, pretty crazy to think back to your statement you said about being within 10 miles of each other. Yeah. Uh, another Michael shared about um, a lot of the disparities are really at root um, based on about poverty. Yeah. And then Gary brought up a really good example of a policy in sharing how uh, housing first approaches are helping to address homelessness. So those are just a few of some really, really great responses. So thanks for, for sharing everyone and keep on doing that. And thanks for um, reframing that question um, for me, Justin, so we can really get at some of um, some of the challenges and solutions that you see uh, see working in your community. Um, as you think about those challenges and potential solutions, don't forget, connect with your um, local community development partners to begin having these discussions with them about how public health and community development can work together to come to a solution. Um, and now... Let me welcome um, back Jennifer Wagley. Jennifer is driven to create a more equitable society where everyone can achieve their full potential. She has 14 years experience in community organizing and joined Avenue CDC in 2009 to create its nationally recognized community initiatives. Jennifer holds master's degrees from Baylor University in Educational Psychology and Theology and was awarded a National Rubinger Fellowship, which supports change agents like herself to develop innovative solutions that improve the quality of life for people and places while connecting them to the broader economy. Welcome back, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I have been to Houston twice. It's a beautiful city. I love it. But like most large cities, um, affordable housing can be a challenge. So can you tell us a little bit about Avenue CDC and its role in creating affordable um, housing opportunities in Houston? 
Yeah, Avenue is a 26-year-old nonprofit in the city of Houston. And um, when we when we first started, it was a group of residents that looked at a neighborhood that was sitting really close to downtown Houston and was like, you know, big changes are going to come to this neighborhood. How do we preserve the history and culture of the community? So Avenue started very humbly um, by moving a, a one, a, you know, abandoned house from one neighborhood into a vacant lot in another neighborhood and repairing it and selling it for affordability to what we've become today, which is um, one of the largest community development corporations in the city of Houston. Um, and one of the myths that we like to, to start out with is that Houston um, for many, many years has been known as an affordable city, a place that everybody had the chance to own a home. And um, most recently in the past decade or so, that has become less and less true. And unfortunately, after Harvey, our housing crisis has doubled. So before Harvey, we had about 350,000 families living in in um, poor housing conditions, either cost burden or in unhealthy situations. Harvey um, impacted about that many units. And so you can imagine where our folks are in relation to housing. Yeah. Now we're looking at a map here. Tell us a little bit um, about what we're seeing. Yeah, I wanted to kind of position um, part of our work, and I'll tell you about all the different lines of our business in just a little bit, but the, the red area is where we've been working the most in the social determinants of health realm. Um, and so about nine years ago, um, in the southern portion of that red area, we started a comprehensive community development model that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, but that is what has um, led to kind of even a shift of focus for the organization. We still do housing, but we do so much more. And we when you look at these two neighborhoods, um, I know that there's rural um, folks, uh, people that uh, serve rural areas here. Um, we are like two tiny cities or maybe medium sized cities. Um, so south of that 610 loop there, you can see that's about a population of 30,000 and above that another 20,000. So we're talking about a target catchment area of about um, 50,000 people in our comprehensive work. Okay, yeah, thanks. That helps us um, visualize a little bit better what your service footprint looks like. And um, tell us a little bit about Avenue's comprehensive community development model. All right. So I, I started off by sharing a little bit about our housing, how we started with, you know, just single family homes. And we've still been doing single family homes. Um, it's getting more and more challenging to provide a single family home um, for sale to a moderate um, income family in the city, but we are still trucking ahead and, and making that possible. We're finishing our first um, full subdivision uh, this year of 95 single family homes. But we also develop apartment complexes because once we sell a single family home, um, that is no longer in what we would consider an affordable housing safety zone. And so our apartment complexes really serve as that permanent affordability option for families. So that's the first part of our work. Family asset building is answering that question is how do you get families ready for home ownership? So we have a team um, dedicated to walking people through the process of, of understanding, learning, saving, getting their credit repaired, doing all things necessary to get to the dream of home ownership. Um, and so that's our asset building programs. Comprehensive community development, we are gonna dive deep into, but it's, it's what most impacts this conversation today. And then unfortunately, because of Hurricane Harvey, or fortunately, with the, the skills we had from home bar education and counseling, we were, um, within a month, we were able to open a hurricane recovery center. We call it a housing recovery center. And so we um, launched both the counseling side of that, but also home repair navigators, and are at the, this moment repairing about 20 units a month. Um, for Hurricane Harvey recovery. Oh. So you literally like kind of transitioned the services that you were offering to meet that immediate need. Yeah, it was one of the one of the gifts of us being comprehensive is that mm -hmm. we had we had so many different partners in place and community residents to rely on and institutions that we were able to do both that first volunteer wave of response and help people with immediate needs. But within a month, we opened the housing recovery center so that we could start dealing with people's longer term housing needs. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for sharing that. And, and earlier, Sarah talked about how CDCs or community development corporations, just to be clear, um, actually 
are known for engaging their their residents and community partners. That's one of the hallmark of the of the types of things that you guys do. So here, I know you've given us a list of the 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 ways that Avenue CDC has engaged community. Um, I know we don't have time to to go through all of them, but I would love for you to share three that you think have been very successful with um, with helping you engage community or residents. All right. Well, I told Erica they're all important, so um, <laughs> I can talk to y'all. There's a lot of you, so I can't talk to you individually, but I'll start with community uh, focus planning. Um, when Avenue first started our comprehensive work, it was about nine years ago, and planning was used as a tool, kind of a platform to gather people. So we um, would do a lot of individual meetings with residents in the community. We were bringing lots of, of uh, partners together, but planning was the, the, the platform that we were able to really launch a comprehensive initiative to try to figure out what was going on in the neighborhood, what people cared about, and what they were willing to act on. And so on your screen, you see the most recent plan for the near north side community. Um, it's actually an award-winning plan. Um, and I think one of the things that makes me the proudest of this plan is, is that it is actually moving the needle. The first one we did in the near north side um, when I first started my career at Avenue, um, within the first five years, we had kind of knocked it out of the ballpark but it was really project focused. This plan um, is very outcome um, focused and really moving the needle around the things that are important um, to uh, the, the health and well-being of families in the communities. So planning is one of our kind of, um, we have to have it as a linchpin to the work that we do because it helps create that um, united vision and strategies to help improve um, things in the community. Okay. And then next, I would say organizing. And um, some CDCs do organizing and some CD community development corporations do not do organizing. Um, Avenue has chosen to do organizing in the neighborhoods where we do deep engagement um, because we want to be able to create power Poder. We want people in our communities to be able um, to affect the change that they want to see in the neighborhood and, and thus be resilient in the face of whatever comes their way. We know that there's not any one um, philanthropic or charitable um, intervention that can solve all the concerns of the neighborhood. And so organizing is a way of building leadership and helping them have the capacity and the efficacy to affect the change for, for generations to come, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, because of this webinar, I wanted to highlight collective impact. And I know that there is kind of a, a capital C, capital I, I it, it doesn't matter to me, but collective impact is a useful tool for us because it's a way that we gather partners um, to dream big and to help the neighborhood residents accomplish their vision for their community. And the, um, I guess the biggest example of that in our current portfolio is that we are a Build Health Challenge awardee for this year. Mm -hmm. And so we, I think we were one of 12 in the nation and it really shows uh, the development of that, that uh, strategy for Avenue. Great, great. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit later in the webinar about um, our discussion group that's coming up and in our discussion group we may have some time to to delve in a little bit more into these other elements of engagement but um anyway jennifer for those of us with um public health backgrounds we sometimes don't immediately think of community development partners when we're thinking about designing a community health initiative but in fact, I have learned that Avenue CDC is actually a leader in community health initiatives. So tell me how that, um, how, to, how to an affordable housing organization evolve into this role. Well, it was an accident. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, really, we, we, you know, Sarah mentioned it before, housing is obviously one of the foundational uh, social determinants of health, right? It's one of the mm -hmm. key things to having people be healthy and whole. And so we were all already in that stream. But what really, really brought us into it more was listening to the residents of the neighborhoods that we seek to serve. And a lot of what came up when we were talking and listening and having, um, you know, neighborhood residents step up as leaders is about parks and safety. Um, safety is, I find, um, a really unifying uh, topic. Um, everyone wants to feel safe. I think Maslow probably taught us that early on, um, but the community residents can teach us that again. So they want safe places to play, to walk. And so when we started addressing um, the issues that residents were bringing to us with the residents, um, we 
we've developed what we call our park portfolio. So these are all the parks that we've worked on over the last nine years. And one of the techniques that we use um, that I want to share with you guys is crime prevention through environmental design. We call it SEPTID for short, um, but it comes out of criminology and sociological studies about the design of space and the way space spaces are used by humans. And so, um, you know, is it light or is it dark? And so we would, we would um, send out, gather a group of residents, everybody gets a clipboard and um, people love clipboards. It makes them feel empowered and important. And we would bring, you know, a few police partners to the table and we'd do a safety audit of a space during the daytime and a safety audit at night. And then I would have an AmeriCorps member or another service member or an assistant put together kind of a, a um, a term paper, if you will, of all the findings. And then we started turning that into different um, people that might have influence over the particular area we were surveying. And we found that in documenting um, safety concerns that our public sector really did have an uh, the ability to address some of those concerns and that um, philanthropic dollars have followed. And so we became um, a, a more in the health initiative right. realm through that process. Right, and actually received an award too, right? Yeah, uh, Sarah mentioned it earlier, but I think it was it was our learning curve that mm -hmm. when um, the health innovation um, opportunity came up and we were looking at applying and we had to write down all of the parks and the sidewalks and walkabilities, we were like, oh my gosh, we are, we are doing so much in relation yeah. to health. Yeah. Yes, yeah, safety is one of those things, like you said, that connects us all. And then also, you guys, um, in terms of helping people with well-being, you have art and creative placemaking. I think that's, that's wonderful. And what we're seeing here are images from the various neighborhoods of the art that you have in, in these neighborhoods. And, and I know we don't have time to go over all of them, but there's one in particular that you wanted to lift a story about. And it's a really nice success story that I'd love for you to share with our audience. So will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I wanted to highlight the, um, the um, colorful basket that you see um, woven together on your screen. Um, the, the poles on the outside actually are painted by community residents and they're a labyrinth um, that you could actually walk through. It was a temporary installment. So I heard somebody from Houston, it's, it, it's just been taken down, so you missed it. But um, the basket itself is woven with vinyl that um, high school students and middle school students painted and then it was woven together. And the reason it was so significant for for, for me um, personally and professionally, and I, and I hope for the rest of the community is that a lot of our, our thought is around social cohesion and how do we reweave the social fabric to make us all stronger together. And the journey is arduous. Um, I think the labyrinth kind of suggested that and it takes lots of different turns, but at the end, um, the, the, the resiliency and the, the good things that come from, from it is a really beautiful product. Yeah, that's such a beautiful story. So um, thank you for sharing that with our audience. And you talked a little bit um, before about the Build Health Challenge, but um, I want you to share a little bit about um, a little bit more with our audience because this is one of the ways, it's a collective impact project, you talked about that, but it's one of the ways that you all have been able to engage both the health department and your hospital systems in creating health together in Houston. Yeah, I mean, the Build Health Challenge, again, on the hills of the Health Innovation Award, we had a little more courage and a little more understanding of our growth as an organization, maybe even our evolution. And so the Build Health Challenge was announced and we, you know, looked at each other and, and thought, should we do this? Um, and lo and behold, the health department approached us and said, hey, we're thinking about this. And so it was, it was kind of a sign that it was meant to be um, doing the grassroots organizing work and bringing, br building power in the community is one part that we feel like is really important and it makes our collective impact a little unique um, or a lot unique because if you know much about collective impact some of the criticism can be that it's too heavily grass tops so yeah. too heavily agency mm -hmm. um, and so our unique unique mix is to make sure that the grass tops is always informed and in relationship with the grassroots so the Houston Health Department came to the table and then a major hospital system was will willing to step up and we put in this application we dream so big and I think what's important about this is that you know for nine years we've been doing the work and, and receiving recognition and good projects have been happening but it really takes big players to move some of these significant social determinants of health 
health or the outcomes we're trying to move, right? So really to decrease obesity levels and to, you know, um, reduce the number of um, emergency room visits. Um, the neighborhood can't do that alone. And so um, the Build Health Challenge is just that, um, that everyone is leaning in. These big partners are leaning in with the neighborhood residents and we're send, seeing tremendous results. That's great. That's wonderful. And Justin is chatting out um, a link to the Build Health Challenge website. So you can hear more about, um, you can see some profiles of, of the cities that are part of this challenge, including um, Houston. So one last question for you, Jennifer, is one that, that kind of stays on my mind a lot when I think about community development, because I know that you all in the community development space have the best intentions to improve neighborhoods, but how do you guard against the unintended consequences of community development, like resident displacement? Yeah, I think it's really important for um, us to, to recognize, especially community development corporations, but anybody that's working to improve um, the built environment of neighborhoods is that um, often there's not structures in place to protect the historic residents. And so um, these neighborhoods are, are um, many times low income. And so improvements need to happen. We need to have lead free, healthy homes. Um, we need sidewalks and healthy play spaces, but that also means that other um, people outside of those neighborhoods will be more attractive to those neighborhoods. And so it's just, for me, it's really important that all of our partners understand the double-edged sword of this work and that we have to, to the extent that we is possible and um, is to guard against it. And so that's why, again, comprehensive is really important for Avenue. So at the same time that we're working to build affordable housing and working to improve the social determinants of health, we're also working to, to make sure, sure we have workforce strategies in place. Um, neighborhoods, if there are any preservation tools, I know some cities and states are better at this. Houston and Texas in particular are not really good at giving um, residents, especially low-income residents, a way to stay in their historic neighborhoods but we do have a few and we use them as big and bold as we can um, making sure people are taking you know part of their tax exemptions and so when you go in with a, a project like the like for us the lead abatement program where we're improving the appearance of homes we al we also have to look at what the financial cost of that will be down the road for the families yeah well thank you so much for giving us like some real life examples of how this can happen um and how community development can work um to improve the the health of community we're gonna ask you to stick around as well because we got some questions coming up but um right now before ali shares questions that have been coming into the question box i want to invite you to a special opportunity to continue the discussion um like Typically, we have discussion groups following our webinars the week after, but today we're going to do something a little bit different, and I want to invite you to a discussion group that we're going to have um, regarding this topic and this webinar and the content of the webinar immediately after the webinar. And this will give you an opportunity to just kind of dig into a little bit more of what you've heard and ask some, some questions um, of our guests because they're both going to be there. Both Jennifer and Sarah will be there. But also to ask questions of each other and to share what you see is happening in your communities that, that is working or showing some promise. We really want to know that. So Allie's going to open up a Zoom meeting space for you to kind of explore these strategies. And we could talk about it a little bit more. We Don't worry about registering because some of you are with us each month say, oh, I didn't have time to register. You don't have to register. We're actually going to chat out a link to the um, to the discussion group um, to, um, in, a, in a few minutes. So let me just tell you, this is gonna be different than a webinar. This will be an interactive face-to-face -face discussion. You actually have a picture there on the slide of what it's gonna look like. So you will be able to see each other's faces. You will be um, able to connect and talk with each other. Um, and it's going to be facilitated. We're going to have a discussion that's facilitated by our partner, Joanne Lee, from Healthy Places by Design. Again, both um, Sarah and Jennifer are planning to join the discussion, and um, I'm actually going to join, too, once I end the webinar. So please do consider joining if you want to, to dig in a little bit more.
and we'd like to know exactly what you may have an interest in learning about in that discussion group. So I'm going to ask Justin to launch a poll and tell us a little bit more about what you would like to chat about in a discussion group. Um, we can talk about, and you can just check all that apply, partnership strategies and collective impact. Um, we could talk about, and Sarah had kind of started talking about, about those different ways that you can connect those partnership strategies. We could talk about elements of resident engagement. Remember, Jennifer was talking about three of the elements that was on that list. We could talk about development without displacement. And then what can public health offer community development partners and vice versa? So tell us what you're thinking that you would like to dig in a little bit more about. And I am going to ask Justin to let us know what folks are saying. Hey there, everyone. Um, I haven't closed the poll quite yet because uh, okay. there's still some responses coming in, but uh, it looks like resident engagement and development without displacement um, look like they'd be popular choices um, as well as some partnership strategies. So we can try and cover as, as much as possible, I think. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, keep, we'll, we'll actually keep the poll open for a couple of seconds and just see where folks are landing, where their interest is. Allie, I'm gonna get you all teed up. Let's see what questions are coming in. You don't mind? Yeah, great, thanks, Erica. Um, and thanks again to Jennifer and uh, Sarah for sharing today and presenting. So great to have you guys with us. Um, wanted to get started uh, digging in a little bit more on um, hearing from you guys around what guidance would you share around planning for sustainability? Sure, did you, I'll, I'll take that one because um, it's an easy one and I like the easy questions. <laughs> Thank, thanks for laughing. Um, so I, with sustainability, I think about it in two, in three ways. The first is I love that you framed it as planning for sustainability. Thinking about it from the very beginning is critical. Now that's the easy part. Um, when you think about what are the criteria that lead to more likely um, success in terms of sustainability, I think about it in two buckets. The first is around partnerships. One of the things we find is that um, consistent leadership is incredibly critical. And so if you have a major partner that steps out, having a bank of partners that are supportive and really truly engaged is sort of a, a protective factor against that. The second one um, is really around data evaluation and case making and how one develops sort of a value story about what the value it is that is this effort brings is really critical. And that is both about understanding the data part of it. What do the partners care about? So for example, we had one effort that did really fantastic um, evaluation around improvements in connection to primary care and flu vaccines and, um, and also around um, you know, connections to primary care and et cetera. But they didn't have the Medicaid data. And that really turned out to be the critical answer for their partners. So part of it in terms of thinking about the case making is not just there's one answer for what that evaluation looks like, but understanding um, what the what the various stakeholders care about in terms of making the case. I think in this space, one of the things that we're seeing increasingly is that health partners um, remain very focused on things for which there's a short-term return on investment. Um, somebody earlier in one of the comments talked about housing first, and certainly in terms of health investment, we're seeing that housing first efforts that are around supportive housing for folks who have um, you know, multiple chronic diseases and our frequent um, utilizers in the emergency department, it's, it's easier to get investment for that than something in which the returns are um, maybe longer term, more diffuse, as it not, not that they're not, um, in fact, they may be more meaningful, but they're happening to a larger group of, uh, of folks and maybe over a longer term. And so that's, that's the limiting factor. Um, but those are sort of two sets of ways of thinking about it. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, and this next question I might offer as um, maybe you start and then Jennifer, if you have anything to add. Um, would just love to hear 
some specific some specific strategies and ways that you foster resident and partner engagement. And this question is for Jennifer, right? Okay. She said you would start, but I definitely oh, want I, it. I oh, want good. it so yeah, forth. No, I, I missed that. I must have read your mind, Jennifer. Go. Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna <laughs> arm wrestle you or anything, but <laughs> Um, so, I mean, the, the easy, you know, we all look for big answers and, and, and this one, I really think it is a small answer that is really hard to accomplish. It is building relationships. One-on-one -on -one relationships in the community is our primary tool um, to um, finding, identifying talent and leadership to help um, do things that, that take a lot, of, a lot of people coming together to get done. And when you think about agency leaders, um, and um, we are all humans too and so relationships are really at the core of that work too how do we how do we build our collective impact strategies it's by connecting with um, various uh, organizations and agencies and talking to the leadership there um, or the program managers there or whoever we can get into and learning about them as humans first and all and then learning about what um, drives the, the organization what goals they have and figuring out where the shared interests are and how we might be able to align to move together to, to improve the lives of the people that we seek to serve and Jennifer I I'm so glad you went first because that that was a beautiful, beautiful response. And one of the things that I think is interesting about Jennifer's response, she's 100% correct about the relationships, but I also think she said shared interests. And I think one of the things that's really critical is, um, is thinking about the fact that it isn't always that everybody has the exact same goal in mind. It may be that there's a shared interest along the way that can folks to um, different goals, right? Um, so I'm gonna give an example of what that might look like. So it might be that your major goal in your, for your organization is going smoke free. Um, and housing organizations care about that, but it also is challenging to manage. Um, and they care deeply about residents and resident stability and also, you know, going, also certainly going smoke free. But that may not be their necessarily number one priority right now. And so you can come in and, and support this in a way that gets your goal and their goal at the same time without meaning that everybody has to perfectly align on what's the ultimate goal, um, you, know, you know, going through a huge collective impact process. It's figuring out where the interests overlap um, and taking that first step. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, I'm recognizing that we are almost at the top of the hour, so I'm going to turn it over to Erica to close us out. Thanks, Allie, and um, thanks, Jennifer and Sarah. And I want to tell you all about a couple of webinars that are happening um, next month. First, um, I will be joining Sarah, and I will actually be Sarah's guest at NeighborWorks for part two of this series. And um, that um, part two will be, is called Building Communities of Opportunity, the Intersection of Health and Community Development. So um, look out for that webinar that's coming up. And you'll also hear from Allie next month with evidence at your fingertips, tools to inform decision-making. And if you're looking to create change in your community, the first thing you wanna do is be sure that you pay attention to the evidence and this webinar can help you do just that. That. You can register for these webinars at countyhealthrankings.org. And um, I do realize the webinars are on the same day. However, um, if you register for them, just know that um, we will send you um, a link to the archive webinar since if you cannot attend both of them. Okay, so um, Justin, I'm gonna ask you to send that link out right now for the discussion group. I know Allie is already planning to go ahead and open up that, that um, Zoom meeting window. And um, join, please join Sarah and Jennifer um, in that discussion group right now. 
And I want to thank Allie, Justin, and our team of technologists for their hard work producing this webinar. And I want to, of course, give a very special thank you to Sarah and Jennifer for sharing their wisdom with all of us. And lastly, on behalf of NeighborWorks and County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, I want to thank our audience for participating. See you in the discussion room in a few minutes and next month for another informative County Health Rankings and Roadmaps webinar. Have a great afternoon.